Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed, into the houses of your officials and on your people, and into your ovens and kneading troughs. The frogs will come up on you and your people and all your officials. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same things by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people, that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs, except for those that remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said. Moses replied, It will be as you say, so that you may know there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials and your people. They will remain only in the Nile. After Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh. And the Lord did what Moses asked. The frogs died in the houses, in the courtyards, and in the fields. They were piled into heaps, and the land reeked of them. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Thanks, Trent, for uh, reading for us. So, uh, some time ago, I heard about this uh, famous sermon preached uh, back in the 50s uh, called One More Night with the Frogs. A uh, black preacher with the power and passion only that a black preacher can have. And so I asked a bunch of people uh, about it, and nobody had ever heard of it. Turns out, not nearly as famous as I thought. So uh, that left me with a sermon title and a passage of scripture. So here we go, one more night with the frogs. And let's start with, uh, well, let's let's actually uh, pray first. Father, as we look at your word this morning, we invite you to uh, speak into our lives. Uh, Open our ears to hear what it is you want to say to us. Amen. So I'm going to start with a question, and that question is, when would you like to begin to experience God's power and promises in your lives? Uh, When do you want to experience God reaching out in power into your life? When would you like to experience his saving presence or experience his healing presence? When would you like to hear his guiding voice in your life? And some of you might say, well, Russ, that's that's really quite a simple, uh, silly question, isn't it? Wouldn't everyone say, right now, I want to I experience God's power in my life immediately? Well, we might be surprised by the answer and even by the answer that we give at times. Now consider the story that, uh, that Brent, uh, Trent just read for us. In Exodus chapter 8, we read Pharaoh's response his answer to that question. Now a little bit of background to the passage. Uh, Moses, or God had told Moses to go to Egypt to ask Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. Uh, but Pharaoh isn't just going to release his slave labor force. And so he said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to let the uh, people go. And so God sends a series of plagues upon uh, Egypt and Pharaoh uh, And when we get to chapter 8, the plague is that of frogs. And this isn't just an ordinary infestation of frogs. There's frogs everywhere, in their beds, in their ovens, in their uh, 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 things they, they make to prepare their food. There's even frogs in their boots. Pharaoh was uh, fed up. Finally, he's fed up with the frogs. They're driving them nuts. 
And he comes to Moses and says, would you get rid of the frogs uh, for me? Uh, by the way, what kind of shoes did the, uh, did the Egyptians wear during the plague of frogs? Open-toed. <laughs> I know that's bad. Uh, that's all I got today. Uh, that's it. That, that's all I got. Yeah, it's a good thing I'm retiring, eh? <laughs> uh, but note uh, Pharaoh's response to Moses. Verse 9. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you, for you and your officials and your people that uh, you and your houses may be rid of the frogs, except those who remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said, Moses replied, It'll be as you said, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. So uh, Moses says, Pharaoh, when would you like me to get rid of the frogs? I'll set, uh, you set the time. And he says, tomorrow. In other words, not today. Let me have one more night with the frogs. Why would he say that? Why would anyone say? Like Pharaoh, at times, uh, uh, we, uh, often we get to decide when it is that we will start to experience God's powerful presence in our lives. Now I'm going to venture out a guess that some of us, maybe a lot of us, have frogs in our lives. Some of the things that plague us, that annoy us, that drive us crazy, that keep us from experiencing God's fullest and best in our lives. Now, I don't know what your frogs look like. Your frogs might come in the mail marked past due. Or your frogs might be difficulties in, uh, in establishing la uh, solid, lasting relationships. Or maybe your frogs are spiritual in nature. A root of bitterness that has welled up inside you and is destroying your life. Or maybe it's a demonic presence. Or maybe your frogs are related to your work and your ministry. Now, I don't know what your frogs are. But at times, at various points in our lives, we all need to deal with frogs in our lives. Now, we've heard promises from God, just a few examples of the kind of promises that are, are in Scripture. Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, all other things, and he's referring to what we eat, what we drink, what we wear, uh, the basic necessities of life, he's, all other things will be given to you. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I came that you might have life and have it to the fullest, or have it more abundantly. Uh, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. My, uh, the prophet Malachi says, put God to the test in this. Test God. See if he's not true and accurate on the Test God. Bring in the whole tithe, and see if God doesn't open up the floodgates of heaven and shower blessing upon your lives. That's just four promises. There's Hundreds of promises in the Scripture. We hear these promises and we want to experience the truth of them in our lives. But sometimes, like Pharaoh, we look at God and we say, tomorrow. And so the second question I have for you this morning is, what are the frogs that you're putting off dealing with until tomorrow? Our problem, like Pharaoh, we sometimes say to God, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, Jesus, I'll make you Lord of my, of my life and I'll start following you. Tomorrow, I'll get my prayer life together. Tomorrow, I'll start studying your scripture. Tomorrow, I'll start reading the Bible. Tomorrow, I'll offer forgiveness to the people who've offended me. Tomorrow, I'll ask for forgiveness from those that I've wounded. Tomorrow, Lord, I'll get involved in that ministry that you've been prompting me to get involved with. Tomorrow. Not today, tomorrow. The question we need to ask ourselves is, why do we spend so much energy at times putting off things? Till t why do we want to spend one more night with the frogs? And so, uh, th three reasons. 
why we say tomorrow to God. First of all, sometimes we want more time to figure things out ourselves, to solve things on our own. Certainly Pharaoh thought that. He believed that he could figure out, maybe, maybe if he had till tomorrow, he could figure out a way to get rid of the frogs himself. Then he wouldn't have to submit himself to God's will. We can often think that way ourselves. Like the, the woman who wrestles with alcohol. It started off as a social drink here and there, but suddenly she needed several drinks a day just to make it through. Family and friends tried talking to her, suggesting programs or help that she could get, but she rejects all their efforts and says, I'm going to figure this out on my own. Or a family man who spends most of his hours working, focusing on his work instead of spending time with his family, and he refuses to believe that his life is off-center. He gets defensive when anybody talks to him about, uh, about, hey, maybe you should give more time to your family. Even when friends, family, and co-workers warn him of possible consequences, he continues down the same path ignores their suggestions, and he says, I'm going to figure this out on my own. Sometimes we say tomorrow to God because we want to figure things out ourselves. Secondly, sometimes it's because we're afraid of the consequences of following God. Pharaoh is not used to suffering consequences. He was the guy who uh, was in charge. He would give orders. If there were consequences for someone to face, not him, someone else had to do it. Someone else had to pay the price. He was unwilling to submit to God's will and pay the consequences. He never, and because of that, he didn't experience God's powerful presence in his life. And finally, sometimes we say tomorrow to God because we don't want to humble ourselves. Like Pharaoh, we struggle with humility and submission to God. Satan likes to slither into our lives, tempting us to be disobedient to God, misleading us into believing that we don't need God to solve things in our lives. We become self-centered and begin living for ourselves. If we want to experience God's power in our lives, we need to humble ourselves and place God in control of our lives. What if, what if, uh, Pharaoh had said to Moses, I'm going to get rid of the frogs right now. And Moses would have stopped right then and there and prayed. And right before Pharaoh's eyes, the frogs would have started dying and been hopping away or whatever they did. I think it says they died, right? But if all, they all, all around, all these frogs are dropping dead. He'd have to admit that God did this. God is great, and I must submit myself to him. But if he says tomorrow, and Moses leaves, and at some random time tomorrow, Moses prays, but the frogs start dying or hopping away, was it because Moses prayed? Or were they going to leave anyhow? Maybe, maybe the frogs just decided to go on their own. Maybe God isn't so great. Maybe I don't have to submit myself to him. And if I say tomorrow, then for sure I don't have to submit myself to him today. We say tomorrow to God because we want more time to figure it out ourselves. We're afraid of the consequences of saying yes to God. And we don't want to humble ourselves and submit ourselves to God. And so um, we say tomorrow. Now here's some good reasons why we should stop saying tomorrow and start saying today to God. Why should we say today? If we continue to say tomorrow, our plagues could get worse. Pharaoh's plagues didn't end with the frogs, but worsened into gnats and then locusts and boils and uh, hail and finally the death of his oldest son. Basically, the plagues destroyed his life. In hindsight, he probably wished he hadn't said tomorrow. The person who struggles with alcohol keeps putting it off 
That person continues to do, need more and more alcohol, has less and less success in quitting until one day she hears her boss saying, you know, can't really count on you anymore. You no longer have a job. And suddenly her plagues just got worse. This happened to a very good friend of mine. He was a pastor, a church planter, struggled with alcohol. Didn't get help. Spent his last days living on Main Street in a hotel. His plagues got worse. The man who continues to make promises that he's going to get his life in, in balance, get his life together with his family, walks in but doesn't take any action, doesn't make the changes, one day walks in to find a note on the table just saying we're gone. Suddenly his plagues got worse. Why are we surprised with the results of our indecision? The scripture has something interesting to say about putting things off till tomorrow. Jesus said, uh, this is uh, from um, Matthew chapter 6. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You could also summarize what Jesus is saying there is, do not boast or uh, um, deal with today's trouble today. Uh, the do not boast, that's the next verse, Proverbs 27. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. And so the scripture is saying, don't put things off till tomorrow. Second reason why we need to start saying today to God is tomorrow may never come. James 4 says this. Now listen. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, uh, uh, spend a year there, carry on business, make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen to you tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that disappears for a little while, or that appears for a little while and then vanishes. James uh, chapter 4. The reality is that when we say tomorrow to God, what we really mean is not today. For many of us, tomorrow never comes. We never get around to it. Jesus had a word for those who put off doing things till tomorrow. He told a story in Luke chapter 12 about a man who, uh, to store all his wealth, kept building bigger and bigger barns to store everything he had. But God says to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. So a question for us is, what kind of things are we procrastinating on in our lives? Are we prepared to stop putting them off until tomorrow? Now, as you're listening to this sermon, some of you might object and say, Russ, I want God to work in my life today. In fact, I've been calling out to him. I've been begging for him to work in my life. I, I want him to heal me. I want him to change the circumstances. I want to see him do a miracle in my life. I want him to fix things in my life. Your sermon just doesn't make any sense. Because I choose now. I want to see God do something now. I've been praying for this for years. But nothing happens. Nothing changes. God doesn't show up in power. This sermon seems like a bunch of nonsense. Well, thanks for sharing. Sometimes when, you, when we look at this, kind of, doesn't it feel that way to you? Okay, I guess we just pack up and go home then, right? Now, here's my response. Often when we look for God to do something in our lives, we look on our own terms. We know what we want God to do, but maybe he's more interested in working in some other area. His, he has plans, he's at work, and we simply don't recognize what he desires to do in us. For example, we pray for healing for an illness we have, but we're not, we're not healed, and we say, see, Russ, I told you. 
God doesn't show up like he, you said he would. Sometimes that's because God wants to do something other than what we're asking for. Sometimes he wants to address a heart issue like bitterness or the refusal to forgive rather than to heal us. I, I've seen that. I've seen that where a, a lady came, asked me to pray for her to be healed. I prayed and nothing happened. Absolutely nothing. And so she left kind of disillusioned with God. Came back about a month later. Wanted to talk about it a bit. We got talking and and she, uh, it was, she, had, she had this terrible pain. That's what we'd been praying about. She still had this terrible pain. But we start talking about her dirty, rotten husband. And uh, she chose to forgive him. And all of a sudden she said, Russ, pain is gone. We didn't even pray for her to be, her, her shoulder was healed just by choosing to forgive her dirty, rotten husband. And I have to say, he was a bit of a yahoo. But she still needed to forgive him. One way we say tomorrow to God is by saying today in an area that he's not working in. We want healing for our shoulder pain and he wants to remove a root of bitterness from our lives. Or we want him to heal our abuse of alcohol. And he wants to deal with the pain of life, the pain of, and to forgive the pain that we experienced in our childhood. Now consider this. God, and by the way, I, I, I'm not going to stretch this. I, I'm, I'm looking at the clock. We're, we're going to be done early. We have a wonderful, God has a wonderful today for those who are willing to say yes to him. It's really a rather simple process of receiving God's presence and power into our lives by, uh, by accepting his plans for us for today. First of all, we trust that God's ways are always best. Now, I want to talk about a verse that we throw around church a lot. I, I hear people quote this verse all the time. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You've heard that verse, right? People in our circles tend to like that verse a lot. Let me give you the context. That verse is from Jeremiah. It's written to the people of Israel as they're being hauled off into captivity to Babylon. And so what they've experienced, what they've seen, is a bunch of people being killed all around about them. Then they're captured, and now they're going to be forced to march from Jerusalem all the way to Babylon. As slaves, life for the next bunch of years is going to be, you think it's going to be good? Life is going to be hard. They're slaves. They're, they're, defeated. They're, they're defeated. They're captured. And God, at that point, says to them, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. <laughs> what? We like to quote this verse, says everything's going to be nice and hunky-dory and smooth and wonderful for us. But that's not the context. The context is hope in the midst of very painful times that are going to be ongoing. I think the most difficult thing for us to accept is the fact that no matter what God asks of us, no matter what we, He asks us to do, His plans for our lives are always better than our own plans. 
throughout our lives, we cling to our problems because we don't want to let go of our plans. We don't want to follow God's plans. In reality, our breakthroughs come when we let God be God by trusting in His ways. Proverbs says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. And then what? He's going to make your paths straight. Doesn't mean life is going to be easy. Doesn't mean that everything is going to work out the way you want. It doesn't mean that God's going to answer our prayers exactly the way we pray them. But it does mean that God is going to be involved in our lives. He's going to be active. And when God is involved and active in our lives, it is good. Secondly, or finally, we need to say yes to God's Lordship daily in our lives. Back to uh, uh, Matthew 6. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The problem with Pharaoh is not that he wouldn't say yes to God. The problem was he would say yes, and then later he would change his mind. And we do that. We need to keep saying yes. We need to say yes to Him on a daily basis. I'm going to end with a story uh, I heard from a youth pastor. He's leading a mission trip in Florida. They're doing evangelism at various, in various towns. And uh, the main thing they were doing is, uh, we call them these random acts of kindness. So they were showing God's love to people in practical ways by doing something uh, helpful to them. Uh, and on the last day, it was beastly hot, kind of like yesterday here. And they decide that the way they can show kindness is hand out cold cans of Coca-Cola to people in the parking lot of a grocery store uh, down in the States, Winn-Dixie. I don't know if you ever you remember that store. But that's where they're at. There is this young guy in their group, a 14-year-old surfer guy uh, with dangling earrings. They called him Skunkhead. Uh, because he had black hair with a white stripe dyed down the center of his head. Right? But Skunk Hat had become a Christian three months earlier. And he was keen about uh, Christ and he was bold in his talk. And so uh, Skunk Hat, can of Coke in hand, spots this older 45 year old guy across the parking lot, you know, bib overalls, big, you know, probably even bigger than this. Maybe not. That might be about the right size, but, but the old uh, the coverall strap, you know, and the shotgun rack on the in the back of the truck. And uh, Scott walks up to him and says, "Hey, you want a coke?" And the guy looks at Skunkhead and he says, "Yeah, no thanks, no." Turns to walk away, and then he turns back and he says, "So why is it that you're doing this?" And Skunkhead says, "Well." We're just demonstrating God's love to people by, in practical. We're just giving out this Coke to, to, to help people understand that God loves them. And this guy says, well, that's a really great idea. Yeah, that's, that's great. Someday I want to get my life right with God. Uh, someday. And so he turns to go, and Skunkhead grabs him by the suspenders and pulls him back and says, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Someday you want to you wanna get it right, but you're not going to do it today. That, like, what, what happens if you die today? And the youth pastor is watching, you think, oh no, Skunk is going to get his head crushed. But the guy just kind of stood there with his mouth, mouth open and said, uh, 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 what, what do I do? And Scott said, get on your knees. And Scott got on his knees, and they, and they prayed right there in the parking lot, in the wind dixie The guy said today to God. I love the question that comes to mind on this. Why would anyone take the most important decision in their life and put it off till tomorrow? 
When would, when would you like to experience God's power and purpose in your life? Why would you want to spend one more night with the frogs? Why not today? Let's pray. Father, we know that you're our God. We know that you are great and powerful. We know that we can come to you and you uh, work in our lives. Sometimes that raises all kinds of questions and confusion in us. But today we choose to trust that your ways are good, that you have our, good, our well-being in mind. We look for you to reach out and in power into our lives, to change things that we cannot change, starting first of all with our own hearts. Father, we don't want to spend another night with our frogs. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.